My name is Rimbalo Melchizedek. I'll be your guide during this uh, video presentation. What you're about to see is a journey of my life through this reality of how I learned about God and the relationships that we have with all life everywhere. Through all of this, I realize that Christ is in the eyes of every person that stands before me, and Christ is in your eyes also. This information is ancient. It's very, very old. It may seem new. It may seem like uh, something you've never heard before. Uh, but it isn't. It's really old. And then the truth is, is that you have it all within you already. Uh, really, you remember things that are so deep inside of you or can remember these things. And this is what this video is all about to trigger these things so that you remember who you are and why you came here and what it's all about, why you're on this earth. Uh, it is my prayer that this be a blessing in your life and that it be, that it open unto you uh, a whole new way of seeing the world, something brand new and something very old. Thank you. I love you very much. What you're about to see is a video of information that has come from many, many, many different directions within my own being. And many people have asked me exactly who it is or where did this information come from, because it's a very, it's a varied uh, set of parameters, and yet it brings, it comes together into one uh, big picture. So just for the record and just for everyone to know who and where this came from, and to give these people credit, uh, I would like to, uh, to talk about who my teachers were and where all of this came from. And in order to do this, I'm going to have to go all the way back to when I was a little tiny kid. And when I was really little, uh, I was Catholic. And I went through all the Catholic schools, uh, all the way up almost to the very end. And uh, through high school, I didn't quite make it through high school, but I got almost through high school. And of course, uh, Jesus was the first person that has ever influenced my life and, and through uh, what uh, is being transmitted to you through here. But as time went on uh, in my early 20s, uh, I began to see that uh, there was more 
not that uh, not that what Jesus had to say was incomplete, only that I had a, a longing for uh, a, a larger picture of, of what was being said. And I made a big switch. I actually became Jewish. <laughs> and uh, I began to study the Kabbalah and, uh, and to see uh, what that had to say relative to what Jesus had to say. And this uh, went on for a few years until something that began to happen in my life uh, in the, the early 70s. Uh, first of all, probably the most important thing that happened was uh, I literally died on April 10th of 1972. And uh, in a single breath, I, uh, part of who I was, you could say, uh, left here. And in, in another breath, that I, when I breathed back in, uh, the person who's talking to you now uh, began to breathe through this body. And uh, that, of course, had a big, big influence on my life. Um, the, uh, at the same time that, that that happened, there were these two angels that appeared in my life. Uh, they have no names. Uh, they were, one of them was, uh, they were both about 10 feet tall. One was purple in color, kind of an ultraviolet color, and the other was green. And over the next few months, when, as they would appear into the room and begin to talk to me, they led me to many, many, many different teachers around the world. Some of them I physically connected with, some of them I psychically connected with, and in various ways I communicated with uh, many people, which was probably about 70, though that's a guess. Um, and interesting enough, they would actually give me the name, address, and telephone number of who I was to connect with, of who my next teacher was. It's kind of a funny feeling. I remember in the beginning, uh, they'd say, okay, you're going to see this person, here they are, and call them up. So I'd just call them up, and sure enough, it would be that person. It used to kind of blow my mind in the beginning, and I got used to it. Um, the very, one of the very first people, and it's someone no one's ever heard of, I'm sure, and his name was Wilf Chipman, and he was an alchemist. And they led me to him, and I studied with him for over two years and I studied alchemy. And he was an extraordinary teacher. He really knew what he was doing on a lot of levels, and, and it was a very important groundwork, especially out of coming out of the Kabbalah. And at the same time that I was working with Ch Ch uh, Wilf Chipman, uh, there was another person that some of you may remember, which was Kirpal Singh, and I began to work through him and work with him uh, during that time. This was in, back in probably about 1972. At that same time, uh, uh, I was uh, brought to or introduced into the order of Melchizedek. It's actually Alpha and Omega, order of Melchizedek. And um, it was the first order of the Great White Brotherhood. There are 72 orders in the Great White Brotherhood, and my introduction was through the first order, the oldest one, and also the youngest order. The youngest order is the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays. And, uh, and so it's through those, the two ends of the Alpha and Omega that uh, I, it would really be more appropriate to say that they work through me than I work through them. Uh, the Brotherhood of the Seven Rays is actually in Bolivia, very near the, uh, the border of Peru. Uh, uh, the entryway is through the Valley of the Blue Moon. Uh, after that time, uh, I became involved very deeply in Sufism. And uh, Suf Sufism, which came out of, uh, out of the Muslim tradition in the Quran, maybe about 700 years ago, was one of the first religions that began to see that really all religions are one. They're all interconnected. Uh, of course, if you ask a Buddhist or if you ask a, a Catholic or someone else if if, there, if there's an interconnection, they'll say no. But if you study deeply and go into the geometries of, of the inner aspects of every religion, of all the eight major religions, they are deeply interconnected. And the Sufis, Sufis saw this a long time ago. And, uh, and so uh, it became my path for about 11 years. And uh, the first teacher that uh, came to me was Hazrat Anaya Khan and uh, who brought Sufism to the West uh, a long time ago, and then later through his son, Pir Vilayat Khan. 
uh, one of the most important teachers that I had through all of this was a man named Murshid uh, Hassan. And Murshid Hassan was the head of seven dervish orders. He actually lives in a concentration camp in, in Israel. And uh, though he's one of the most respected people in Israel, at least uh, in terms of uh, Sufism. And uh, I spent uh, not a long time with this man. It was only a few weeks. But uh, he changed so many of my uh, viewpoints of, of, what, of how I interpreted the reality. Um, he was about 90 years old. He was a skinny little man. He was very healthy. And at that time, I was into macrobiotics, and I was extremely uh, strict about what I ate and, and what, all that kind of thing. And suddenly this teacher comes in who uh, affected me on a very deep level just by being in his presence. And as I watched him work, he, he just began to destroy everything that I thought was, was true on a lot of levels. I thought that the food was so important, and it is in certain ways. But I watched a man here who for two weeks I never saw him eat a single bite of food, nothing. Uh, he may have snuck something in his room or something, I don't know, but I didn't see him eat anything. And, but what I did see him do was he took a cup, of, a cup about this big, put about half filled with pure white sugar, poured this thick coffee into it, and smoked these long cigarettes, these brown cigarettes, and all he did was drink this sugar coffee water and these cigarettes. It's the only thing he ever ate. And yet his light that came off of him was incredible. He, uh, he loved children. He saw children as the, uh, as the true uh, teachers of the world. And if someone would bring a child into the room, he'd be sitting on a stage with 100, 200 people around him. And if someone brought a child into the room, he would just stop. He would get down off, the, off of his chair where he was teaching and have the child put on the chair because he said, That's, uh, that, this is truly our real teachers. There were other... Uh, uh, Sufi teachers that influenced me. One was Murshid Issa, who has uh, the circle of friends from around, around the world. And Murshid Sam Lewis, who was a very uh, important teacher of mine. Uh, uh, I love them all. Uh, I also became involved in, in Hinduism in uh, lots of ways. And, uh, and I don't know if I could even begin to bring up all the different aspects of that. I was very closely connected to Yogananda, and I still love this man, who was also uh, interconnected with the Order of Melchizedek, and uh, probably not very many people from the Self-Realization Foundation know that, but he was. And uh, also Sri Yukteswar, which was Yogananda's teacher, and who has recently uh, uh, given me a great deal of information. Um, also, um, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Now, I know a lot of people, he's, he's triggered a lot of people on that one uh, for his presence in the United States. Uh, he was primarily a Taoist teacher, and he used himself as an example. So here's a man who comes to the United States and has something like 200 Mercedes Benz or whatever it is, or Rolls Royces, and everybody's saying, well, he's just totally into materialism. But what he was doing was showing through his own being exactly what we were doing and using himself. If you understand Taoism, you'll understand what he was doing as a teaching. Um, I was real close with Ram Dass I've, uh, from the very, very beginning, and I really loved this man also. He taught me how that I can just use myself openly, and anything that happens in my life, I can use that openly uh, without fear. And in other words, instead of trying to protect your image of who you think you are, just let God do it and open up and just, and just be who, who you are and don't worry about what anyone thinks or anything else. And uh, it was very, very powerful what Ram Dass gave to me. Uh, I also spent a long time, well, not a long time, but a couple of years at Lama Foundation where Ram Dass taught a lot. And there were many teachers that came through there that influenced me uh, in what happened here. In fact, the very act of living at Lama Foundation was a, a great deal a part of this teaching. In more recent times, uh, Sai Baba has been uh, very involved uh, in uh, what we're doing. Uh, he is involved with uh, something that's called the triphase, which we don't actually get into here yet. It's a higher level of this work. And, uh, and his work uh, is important to what we are doing. 
I even became, while I was at Lana, I even became a uh, Muslim for about a year. I uh, went, I did Salat five times a day, and uh, I passed through all the various aspects and studied the Quran to see uh, how they saw the world and where they were coming from. And it's very beautiful, uh, their point of view. Um, I really love what they have to offer to the world. Uh, the Tibetans played a very important part in understanding uh, the role. The Tibetans probably know more about the Merkaba than anyone else in the world, though Sai Baba is getting very close to it right now. And uh, the biggest teacher that I had through Tibet was Kalu Rinpoche, who uh, died uh, not too long ago, but is now back in human form. He's just a child right now. And... Uh, he was my greatest uh, Tibetan teacher. I, I will always say that. I love him. Though I was, had to, te to study with other ones, uh, I had to go to Boulder and study with Choigong Trumpa Rinpoche. I didn't really like that very much. Uh, it was a lifetime of chaos for him that he was teaching, and it wasn't real comfortable to be in his teachings, but they were important teachings, and I needed to learn what that was about. Uh, there was a little bit of Tarthang Tolku also, it was involved in Tibet, but mostly Kali Rinpoche had the strongest effect on me. I uh, have studied Taoism uh, for a long time, and uh, my main teacher in there was Master Chu Feng Chu, who taught me uh, the Taoist breathing and the breath and how uh, uh, the chi and the power that comes through the breath. Uh, his, uh, his understanding to me was really, really important. And the Yi Ching itself, though it appears to just be a book, is much more than that once it's understood. It's, it's an exact replica of the DNA. And, uh, and that I spent uh, a long time studying. Uh, I feel through almost all of this uh, various religious teachings that Taoism is probably the closest thing that uh, I feel is uh, the closest to my heart. Uh, there have been many psychic uh, and channels that have entered into uh, this work. Um, uh, people, uh, one, for example, was Bashar out of Los Angeles. That's the actual uh, person that comes through the channel. And B Bashar is actually one of the greys, which we will be talking about. He's not actually a grey, he's one of the races that, that was uh, derived from the greys. Coming from the three future, 300 years from our future, coming back here to uh, help correct some of the abnormalities that have happened here. And uh, his work was uh, very interesting to me and in what he has to say. Though I have to admit that probably uh, the biggest influence, uh, or one of the biggest influences, put it that way, that have, that have affected me has been the Native Americans. I have 12 Native American teachers uh, uh, a couple of those I have not even met yet. They're still coming in the future. But uh, I know that that number is how many there are. The first one uh, and the most powerful one that has ever come to me was Grandfather David from the Hopi tribe who held the Hopi prophecy for a long time. And, uh, and what he had to teach me and give to me was essential in all of this. From there also was uh, in the Taos tribe in Taos, New Mexico, was uh, Telus Good Morning, who was the head of the, the uh, Peyote tribe out of Taos, and his son, Jimmy Reyna. And uh, those two, especially Jimmy Reyna, have played uh, a really crucial role. I studied with Jimmy Reyna almost for 14 years, and, uh, and the way that he would teach and what he would show me and how everything was through the Native American eyes uh, is essential in, in what is being presented here. Though so Tell Us Good Morning and Jimmy Reyna were uh, very important teachers in the sense that they worked directly with him on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, two of the most important, even on other levels, more important people from the Taos Pueblo were Juan Concha and Cradle Flower. They were brother and sister. And Juan Concha uh, was the chief of the Taos tribe until the Bureau of Indian Affairs came in and, and didn't allow that anymore, and they made a, a, a governor and a board of directors, kind of. And when they did, they took uh, Juan Concha and made him the cacique, or the religious leader. 
and Juan Concha uh, came to my house for over 35 years before he died, every single year, usually at Christmas time. And I never knew why these guys were coming there. Every year there'd be uh, him and four or five Indians that sit down and eat, eat uh, dinner with us, and I was going, who are these guys anyway? You know, and after a while, you just sort of assume they're there. But uh, he was just making sure that I, he knew where I was all the time because we had a, uh, an agreement going all the way back until the year 1890. And, uh, and there were things that I had to do for them, which uh, you'll understand as this, under, as this uh, video unfolds. Um, Cradle Flower, his, his sister, was, uh, she was a medicine woman, and she taught me so much on so many levels. Every time that uh, I needed to communicate with her, or put it this way, every time she wanted to communicate with me, she would send a crow, and the crow would come to my window, and it would just keep pecking on my window until I'd get on the phone and call her or go down there. It wouldn't leave until I'd go there. And then when, she, when I'd get there and I'd show up at her house, she'd say, well, did you see the crow? And I'd go, yeah. And then she'd tell me. And uh, it's an interesting world. Uh, the area of uh, sacred geometry uh, is uh, an area of, of where great influence has come in also, but you must understand that I didn't even know what sacred geometry was in, for, the, for many years in the beginning. These were just images that was coming to me from the angels, and, and I was just copying them down, and I would get great understanding from them, but I didn't know that there were other people that had studied this before. I thought this was something just I knew. But eventually, uh, many years down the line, I began to realize that other people had studied this thing, and I started working and studying with other people. And there were certain people like Robert Lawler and Keith Kirchlow in their work, which was very uh, instrumental, and Buckminster Fuller, of course. Uh, Stan Tennant in the language work that he has done, and Daryl Langham's work uh, was very, very powerful in understanding uh, the relationship of geometries to life. And uh, people like Dan Winter, and there's many other people that have, uh, Bob Gulick, I don't know if I can remember them all, but there, there are many people that have come in here and, and have uh, uh, shown me things about sacred geometry that have, that have even added to. Though most of this work you're going to see came before I knew any of this. And, um, and probably uh, the person who has influenced the geometry more than anyone else and more information is coming from this one person than just about anyone else, especially around the area of sacred geometry, was someone who uh, is still alive, though he was born 52,000 years ago. I know that's going to be pretty hard to sink in there, but his name is Thoth, T-H-O-T-H. And uh, he, at least that was his name during the time of Egypt. I'll be talking about him uh, pretty soon, and you'll know more about uh, this particular person. But uh, he's extraordinary, and he's been helping people all over the world uh, uh, to understand uh, the deeper levels of what life is really about. And I guess there, in the area of science, there's been one person who has... Uh, uh, dramatically uh, affected many of the ways of my interpretation of the reality through science. And this was a man named Bob Dratch, uh, who lives in Colorado. And his work is incredible because he has understood and now understands the relationship of what's called waveform and reality. Uh, it's uh, the unfoldment of uh, zero point, which is uh, how a womb works, how creation actually comes into being, is at this moment being understood by the world, though uh, not too many people talk about it. And, uh, and so his work has been very powerful. So I'm sure there's probably other people that I'm leaving out, and to them I'm sorry if I haven't at this moment come up with your names. But uh, this is uh, a list of most of the people and areas that have influenced what you're about to see. So, thank you. Because there is uh, one crucial aspect of this, and that is that uh, about 13,000 years ago, something happened on Earth that actually start, was caused, uh, started about 16,000 years ago, but the, the actual physical event was just under 13,000 years ago. 
we did something. We uh, changed the way we breathe, which I'm going to talk about in detail. And that the direct effect of that change in breathing pattern is something called good and evil consciousness, where we perceive ourselves as being inside of a body looking out at what appears to be totally separate from you, which is completely an illusion. There's no truth in that at all. But it, it's, it's a, it, it appears that way to us. And our, uh, our right brain, which is the aspect of us that is feminine and uh, that controls the left side of our body, and uh, it, it is pretty, pretty much in tune, actually. It is aware that there is only one God. Um, that kind of everything's okay, but it can't tell you. It can't really explain to you why. But the left side of our body is where the problem is. The left side of our brain, which controls the right side of our body, the male aspect of us. This is where the real problem lies from everybody that we can... Uh, we, pretty much everyone agrees on this. You know, almost, our left brain, the logical side of us, looks outside of the universe and sees everything polarized separated and there's uh, black and white and there's up and down and male and female and there's the inside and the outside and there's the good and the bad and all these things and so your left brain does not does not see the unity of life and does not really believe that there's only one God it may even say the words I believe there's one God but inside there's this little part that's got this doubt because there's this there's the good guy, there's God, and there's devil. There's all these separated aspects of ourselves. And, um, and so this, uh, uh, these first three and a half, four days, the main purpose is to clearly show your logical side that there is an absolute unity to the reality and that you are an intimate part of that unity and that there is only one God. It's essential in the sense that once your left brain sees that and understands it, then it begins to interlock between and integrate between the left and right brain. And the pineal gland uh, is then capable of functioning again. Because at the moment your pineal gland is, well, it does have a little bit of functioning through linear light that passes through the eyes and goes to the hypothalamus and into the pineal gland, and so you have a certain, about a, a certain amount of uh, functioning of the pineal gland, but its true purpose is to receive light, to receive prana, which is another form of light that's primarily higher dimensional light, and, uh, and it can't do that at the moment. Once this integration between the left and the right brain takes place, then your pineal gland is capable of, uh, of doing something of receiving this pranic light, and then the meditation is possible. So if someone were to uh, just do this meditation in this particular state without having the understanding of these first four days, uh, it's highly unlikely that they would get very much out of it, even if they were doing it perfectly, because they've got a, a block, a, a shield that's, that's blocking uh, that from working. So that's why we have to go through so much of this stuff, and I don't like to do it, and most people don't even like to watch it, because it's hard. And, uh, you know, it's mathematics and all this stuff. Uh, but that's who we're talking to, is, the, is your male side. This is male knowledge. And, uh, and it's also super condensed, which makes it harder. And, uh, this was given only one other time in, uh, in, in the world's history, at least in the last... 13,000 years, and that was in Egypt during the 18th dynasty, and it was only given for 17 and a half years in a short period of time. And there it took them 12 years to present what we're giving you in, in about four days. And so you're getting a super condensed, very rapid uh, presentation uh, of this. So I can understand why some of you come back two or three times <laughs> trying to get, what was that he said? Because <laughs> it's a lot. I know it's a lot. Okay. Uh, uh, I, the other thing about this is that uh, if 
you just come here and listen to what I have to say and then go home and practice the meditation kind of thing, you'll kind of be missing the point in a way because what we're really talking about here, um, what you might say is group consciousness, uh, consciousness beyond your individual self. And because um, uh, as you go up in consciousness, you'll keep coming to these places where you realize that you merge with you might say zillions of other souls. It just keeps going on on these higher and higher levels of awareness. And you have to lose your identity. It's very much like uh, if you look at your body. Your body is always this uh, little microcosm that reflects the macrocosm and all that it is. And you have all these, you've got about 100 trillion cells in your body. And they're all like people. They're different sizes and they have different functions. And they're in different regions and different, you might say, like different dimensional levels and places and things. And they all work together as a whole. But there is this kind of over-person, you, that's beyond all of that. And, when, and coming up through the levels is like a, a, a single cell. You're like a single cell down here, about to go up through the various levels. And when you do, you'll merge with tissues and then organs and, and higher and higher levels of the body until you become this, uh, what, what, really what we're referring to as God is like me relative to the cell. But of course, there's more beyond what we call God. Our, our levels of what we, our concepts of God are limited. But, uh, but nevertheless, we have to go, we have to reach as far as our limits will take us, whatever our possibilities are. And, um, and that's what's about to happen to us. We're about to go up from a cell to a, a person make a huge leap in, in awareness, and it's going to be a big one, and it's going to happen quick, real soon. <laughs> the sooner the better. <laughs> this group consciousness thing uh, need, needs to be reflected here. In, uh, and uh, if, if at this time, if we can begin to merge with this group, just, we've got to start somewhere. We've all come from all over the place. Uh, people here from Hawaii and England and I don't know where else, all over the various places around the United States. But uh, what I do know about these groups is that each one that comes here, uh, I can almost say for certain if you're here at this time, you all have... Uh, connections together, you, you, you may be surprised how much you have in common at certain levels. And, uh, and if you were to go back into past lives, you may have seen how many times uh, you uh, have uh, interwoven with each other before. And uh, you're, you're all been around a long time, most of you. And, uh, and I can almost say with certainty that you are all uh, have more than likely walked into your bodies, though not necessarily, and uh, sometime in your life, and you are almost more than likely interdimensional beings. So you've come from another dimension, not another planet, another consciousness level. And you've come down here for a purpose and a reason, because that's primarily what one of my main purposes of communicating to uh, these groups like this is to act as a catalyst to remind you of uh, who you are so that your memories can come back and you can remember where you came from and why you came here and, and these kinds of things because this is important for you to finish what, what you have to do here. Uh, my background uh, is uh, mostly uh, in mathematics and physics uh, that's what I started out. Uh, I, I got within a few days of graduating in that. I had one quarter left. That was at the University of California in Berkeley when I decided that that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I switched from the left brain to the right brain and went into fine arts and painting. And they thought I was crazy. Maybe I was, I don't know, but I did it. And uh, it took me two more years to graduate. But. I can see the wisdom in that now and why I did that, though I couldn't understand even at the time why I was doing what I did. 
because when you look at what's on the screen here, you'll see it's an integration of art and science, mathematics, and, uh, and religion, uh, which is what all the ancients all tell you, is that those three things are all interrelated. Uh, art from a long time ago was not expressionistic type art that we have now. It was a very holy thing that was done, and it was sacred. But at this point, uh, of course, it could be almost anything. Uh, in my own life, uh, I was, like everyone else, uh, trying to figure out why we were here and what was going on. Uh, I went into the military when I was really young, thinking that might help. <laughs> it did, actually, uh, because I ended up in Vietnam. I spent 13 months there. Uh, long before everything started happening, way back in 1962. And, uh, and uh, found myself out in the jungles and living in uh, 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 just little shacks, learning. Uh, I, what my job was was to teach English to the Vietnamese because I could speak Vietnamese. And so I spent uh, a long time there, and it was there that I, for the first time, that I saw someone different than, than Americans. And I saw the uh, amazing nature of the Vietnamese, which is real different. Their, their, their hearts are so much more open than ours. They were, I mean, I fell in love with them, and I, I didn't want to return. I didn't know what was about to happen. You know, I was, I was ready to just go off into the jungles and forget it and just stay there. But I didn't. And uh, when I got back, I was even uh, stronger wanting to know what was going on, and so I went to college, thinking maybe that would figure it out. And so that's the reason I went into mathematics and physics, trying to figure out what this stuff was out here, you know, and looking in, in that way. And, uh, but by the time I got almost through with that, I realized uh, many things. I realized, first of all, that uh, from, uh, I was being communicated with as I was working through there, which was really who I am now. At the time, I was uh, another person, and, and I was communicating to this other person while he was going to college, and I was giving him all, a lot of this stuff, and I gave him an understanding where at one point he realized that what he was being taught in the schools was completely wrong, and uh, that was partly what uh, made him uh, stop. And, uh, uh, and really, there is no wrong or right. Uh, in, in this, it's always an interpretation. It's how we interpret things. One day, I was, uh, many years later, I guess this was about 19, I, I had graduated from college and I was, uh, I was led to go to uh, Canada. And I immigra immigrated up there. I was going to stay there for the rest of my life at that time. It had nothing to do with the the thousands of people that were going there because of the war. I had an honorable discharge. I was out of all that. I just went there because I felt that's where I was supposed to go. I went into this valley all by myself. There was nobody there. And uh, the following year, 10,000 Americans came into this one valley where I was. I couldn't believe it. It was like incredible. <coughs> and it was devastating to the Canadians. It was absolutely devastating what that did to them. But. Uh, while I was there, uh, for a while, I was living in Vancouver, and my wife and I decided that we were going to begin to search uh, spiritually. And, and, uh, and we did many things. Uh, we, we first started out with, uh, with uh, hip hypnosis. And we gave each other permission to do hypnosis, and we started st working with hypnosis, going in, and, and just studying on our own. And we found out that we could lift out of our body and fly around the room, which was really a lot of fun. And then we found out that we could go downtown and go into libraries and look in books and all kinds of things and come back. And this was getting to be very interesting. Life was getting to be more fun than it was before. And uh, though uh, it didn't have any real answers in itself. And, uh, and one day, uh, I, uh, it was actually Yogananda's book, I think, more than anyone else. Uh, got me interested in Hinduism, and I uh, began to study with this particular teacher, and he was teaching us a, a form of meditation, 
And this was the first time we got very serious behind this. We made these white silk robes with hoods and all this kind of stuff. And sat down and, you know, we were very serious. And, uh, <laughs> and we began to do this meditation, not having any idea where it would lead or what it would mean or anything. When something happened to us that wasn't in his book either, the guy that our teacher who was teaching us. And these two very tall angels, we were in this room that had 15 foot ceilings, and these about approximately 10 foot angels appeared in the room. And uh, they were <clears throat> two of them, and uh, one was uh, kind of an ultraviolet light, uh, the other one was sort of a Kelly green, and uh, kind of a bright blue. <coughs> and they were identical, and they were transparent. You could see right through them. Their faces were so bright that I couldn't see the faces. Still can't see the faces. There was so much light coming from that, that area of their body. And, uh, and they communicated us, with us uh, telepathically, because the sound would come from inside of us. And if, when they first appeared, uh, they actually appeared to my wife first. I didn't see them at first. What I saw is two spheres of light, two round balls about so big, and uh, one green and one purple. And uh, it was only later when I was communicating with my wife, I heard, she says, well, I saw those two big angels. I'm like, really? I saw them. I saw these little balls. <laughs> and it took me a year to see them as angels. I had to work at it real hard. And uh, what they told us was, the very first thing they said when they came in was, we are you. We are not something separate from you, though you are seeing us outside of yourself. We are literally you. We didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what they meant when they said that. And, uh, and the, the other thing they said was that they had no form at all. They were formless. But they used form, sphericalness or angelness, as a vehicle of communication to communicate with us, and so that we, so that there was something that could communicate in a, in a polarity world. Though, uh, from their point of view, they had absolutely no form at all. I uh, <clears throat> these two particular angels and a third angel, which is this gold angel that has been with me uh, also from the same length of time, but has never uh, uh, interacted with me until about a year ago or so, which is now I've been with every one of these workshops for about the last year. Uh, the gold angel has, uh, is uh, what I would call my higher self. The green angel is, is actually the angel of the earth. And the uh, the ultraviolet angel is the angel of, of the sun, of the solar system. It's the consciousness of these, le these various levels of consciousness that are communicated. And so they were, these three different aspects have been leading me through uh, the various levels here that, while I've been here. And it's through them that they have told me uh, which is my next teacher and where to go. And they would come in and give me literally the name and the address and the phone number of someone, which I would just get in meditation. You know, it's really a funny feeling when you just that you hear somebody's name that you never heard or a phone number you never heard, and you get this guy. You go call it, and it actually is that person. It's a, it's, in the beginning, anyway. It's, after a while, I got used to it because it was maybe 65 or 70 teachers that they led me to this way. But in the beginning, it was kind of fun. funny feeling to do that, and so. <clears throat> Almost all the teachers, though there probably are some exception, and most of the information has come through these angels in this particular way. Um, in so leading me to all these different uh, teachers, they've led me to just about, well, they led me to all eight of the major religions. I've been uh, Christian and Jewish and Hindu and Tibetan and Taoist and Sufi and Muslim, and I don't know what the whole rest of them are, I can't remember all, but I, I spent time in each one of these to understand what they are, and then many, many, many of the offshoots. And the American Indians also have been a very, very powerful influence in all of this. And uh, they've given me a, a view from, from many different towers. And uh, 
and what I've discovered from all of this is there, there's really, they're all the same. Each person or each one's religion says, my way is the only way, which is part of the problem here. But if you really uh, go deeply inside of these different religions, uh, their, their symbols and, and what they're saying are very similar, um, in many cases identical, though there's uh, slight different viewpoints, they're still talking about the same thing. They're different names for, for different, different stages of awareness. to give the entire, I've given little pieces of what happened to me from uh, in, uh, coming in here. For the first time, I'm going to give the entire sequence all the way through. Um, I don't know why I'm doing it, but I, I think that's going to happen. It's going to be one of the stories. <coughs> um, the stories that will be told in all of this, which will be life experiences for me as I interpret them, uh, most of these stories are going to be outrageous by normal consciousness and normal ways of thinking. Uh, if it's too much for you, it's okay. You don't have to believe it. Just take it as a myth or a story or, or whatever. And, uh, but do look at its importance in terms of your own life and what it could mean for what we're talking about relative to the subject of this, of this uh, workshop. And, uh, And, and throughout all of this, not only in the stories, but even in the information, don't believe anything I say. Take it for, don't just take it because I'm saying it. Uh, take it in and store it and, and listen to it, but check it out. See if this is true. All of it. Don't just uh, do it. Find out if it's really true. And, uh, and along with all the things that I say are possible, Find out if they're possible. You know, if they're not possible, maybe they're not true. But, but uh, definitely don't just accept something that I say because I said it. And along those same lines, there's one other thing I gotta say because this this happened in Sandpoint, Idaho. There was a little bit of a problem. Um, uh, we are in. We're going to talk about the yugas. These are particular a ages. Uh, we are in the Dwarpa Yuga right now. We just came out of the Kali Yuga, which is the most asleep point in the precession of the equinoxes. And during the, pre, during the uh, Kali Yuga, it is kind of necessary for those people who are a little more awake than the rest of us to keep uh, others awake during that time. And so uh, the student-disciple relationship was created uh, during that time. But that relationship actually ended about 900 years ago. And, uh, and it's actually uh, really out of it now. We're into a different stage. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the kind of uh, student-guru-type uh, relationship is dangerous at this point. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you can still have teachers. There's nothing wrong with teachers at all. But only this total dependence on someone is not, <laughs> though at one point in our history was necessary, at this point in our history is very dangerous. Uh, we are about to pass through certain levels of consciousness where uh, there is not going to be anybody else but you and God, which you're going to find it the same at that point. And you're not going to have someone there to ask, okay, what do I do next? You're going to have to learn how to get what you need to know from within you. And you have all knowledge in you. There isn't anything that isn't known anywhere that you don't have access to. Anywhere, on this distant star, or other level, all, everything's accessible. And everything you need to know at any moment is always accessible to you. You just need to know how to access that 
uh, because of we're kind of been hit on the head. We're kind of, uh, we're kind of have amnesia and a little bit unconscious at the moment. And uh, so my job is just to be a catalyst to uh, for you. Uh, I mean, try to do something very quick and very powerful to try to awake awaken you to a certain level, where from there on in you can uh, not need anybody else, but, but reach within to your own higher self from which uh, you will know exactly what the next step is at moment to moment without having to go outside of your own uh, own self. And, uh, and so, uh, I'm no one special, you know, and sometimes I get this from people where they kind of look at me like I'm somebody special. I'm nobody special at all. I'm just uh, another person. That right now, I'm in the same place you guys are, trying to figure out how to get out of here. And uh, I, the, uh, I have given up everything that I've had on the other levels to come from this, from the same place that you have. And, and we're all in this together. And uh, you know, we're just brothers and sisters. And, uh, and, uh, and so it's real important that we don't do that with me or with anyone else. Uh, from my point of view, though some wouldn't agree, that the, uh, Jesus the Christ and a drunk in a, gar in, a, in a gutter are equal. They're exactly the same. Because it's the same spirit. It's the spirit of God is in both of them equally. Great spirit, a holy trinity, mother, father, child God, creator of all life everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for this circle, and thank you for the love that flows through this circle. For without this love, we would never be able to see you in the eyes of every person before us. And may all the beings of light who wish there to be love and truth and beauty and trust and harmony and peace throughout the cosmos, may those beings who have responsibility with us, be here to help us to open our hearts and our minds so that we can understand what is being presented and make it real in our lives and live it and breathe it and bring it down onto earth. Yeah. And especially the angelic realms the beings of light who never separated from God, who have stayed with us, protected us, guided us, and never broke their, their trust. These beings, which are really us, uh, and whom, at least one way of looking at it, of whom we are all interconnected with in one way or another, to thank them for uh, the help they've given us over the thousands of years. And to ask them, or I would like you to ask your angels, whether you believe in them or not, at this point, just to ask them, invoke them, to come into this room, to be present here, and to help you and to guide you at this time, and maybe from now on. And when you ask them to come in, feel their presence. You don't have to see them necessarily, but you will feel them. And they usually come from behind your left and your right shoulders. Well, not necessarily. So just take the moment now and go within yourself and ask your angels to be here at this, for the next few days. Before we ever even start with the screen, I'm going to uh, describe something so we all have the same language. This is this thing about dimensions. <laughs> we all talk about these other world stuff. We need to get this clear in our minds what that means, at least from the definition that I will give you so that we can all, you may have a different, different, a different definition, and I don't mean to replace your definition. <laughs> I'm just going to give one that we can all talk about so we all have something in common. And um, now when I talk about the fourth dimension or the fifth or tenth or 
120th or whatever. Uh, I don't mean what most, mat most mathematicians would mean, and that is uh, hyperspace going from fourth dimensional tetrahedron, say, to a, four, to a fifth by warping, changing space mathematically. I don't mean that at all, because uh, from my experience, that just simply isn't true. Uh, though you could create those kind of realities, it, it, isn't, uh, it isn't what life has done at all. Um, life is, has separated the uh, different dimensional levels in exactly the same way that it has separated the notes in music. And so, if you were to look at a piano, you've got, uh, you've got your white keys and you've got your black keys. And your white keys are your whole notes, which goes, you know, C, D, E, F, G, etc., just whole notes. And your black keys are your half steps. And your white from C to C is your octave. And your black ones are your pentatonic scale. You've got five notes there. And when you add the black ones to the white ones, you get 12 notes, in, a, in which is called the chromatic scale. So if you get all your sharps and flats in there, you have 12 notes. 13th one is the same note as your eighth note. Uh, that's, that's where your octave on your, on your white keys. That's where you come from C to C again. It takes 13 steps to get back there again. And, uh, and the only difference between each one of these notes in terms of sound is cycles per second. And uh, each one of these notes, if you start at C, and you go to uh, C, uh, C sharp, D, etc., the differences between each of the notes are 11 cycles per second, or multiples of them. They're always 11, 22, 33, 44, 55, 66, 77, 88 cycles per second. The, uh, the relative proportions of that are identical. Well, let me have them put it in another way. Uh, there's something called wavelength in terms of uh, either sound or light, which, just so we get this clear, I'm going to, I'm going to, oh, great. Um, this is wavelength. Wavelength is simply, uh, this is your axis, uh, you know, the sine wave curve that we're all familiar with, which is really a function of a circle. If you have a circle like this, and you cut it in half, you flip this half over to like that, then you've got this sine wave curve. And, um, and the, uh, the wavelength is how long it takes, how, this, if you were to measure this line running down the middle, going from here to here, or from any of the nodal points to another nodal point, but say from here to here, the length of this is how long, uh, that's called wavelength. Okay? And uh, uh, wavelength is everything in this universe. It's everything in all the universes that are associated with us, without exception whatsoever. Or a zip that don't have that aren't a function of wavelength, and and uh, wavelength is everything. It, I mean, I can't tell you what it means. Uh, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, which we are going to in great detail you know, after we've gone a long ways, you're going to see that everything from uh, microwave towers to gamma rays to sound waves to uh, everything is all a function of how long the wavelength is. Change wavelength, and you change the nature of what the energy is, and. Uh, and so with this understanding of wavelength, in other words, this is a long wavelength, and this would be a short wavelength. Everybody get that? And a real long wavelength would be so long that there's wavelengths like uh, your brain waves, for example, that are coming out of your head, are so long that they're almost straight lines. Thanks. Hey, I think we're set up here. I bet this works. Let me see. Aha. All right. Great. Let's get rid of these guys. So, and you've got little tiny wavelengths, and you've got them so little you can't even see them. There's microwave. I mean, they're, they get really, really little, and they get really, really long. And, uh, 
again, your brain waves that are coming out of your head are almost straight lines. And you go to your cosmic waves, and they're so little that they're 10 to the minus 18 or something. They're so small that you can hardly even see them. Uh, if you were to look at the dimensional levels, the only difference between this universe, and when I say this universe, I mean uh, all the planets and the stars infinitely going out, because we think it's infinite, but it isn't, and uh, going within uh, to uh, the atoms uh, at any particular point, no matter where you select, you can go infinitely in, in that direction. This universe that we now know in this room, there's this three different basic levels in this universe, uh, that just constitutes one wavelength. The wavelength of this universe, which was discovered by Bell Laboratories, uh, telephone, is 7.23 centimeters long, which happens to be the average difference distances between your eyes. You take the distance between your eyes, you've got to average 100 people, and you'll find it's exactly 7.23 centimeters. Or if you take the distance across your palms, 7.23 centimeters. Distance between the tip of your nose and the tip of your chin, 7.23 centimeters. We have it spread throughout our body. All life forms have it shuffled throughout uh, their systems. And uh, it was Bell discovered it when uh, they were creating the microwave towers that stretch all over the place. They happen to pick seven centimeters as they're transmitting uh, a wavelength by accident or whatever. And uh, and when they set up the whole system and turned it on and threw the big switches and got the whole thing going, they had this incredible uh, static running through the systems. And when they tried to uh, locate where it was, they looked through their systems and they looked into the earth and looked everywhere else. But then when they pointed up to the heavens, they said, oh no, it's coming from everywhere. <laughs> and it is literally everywhere. Uh, and the reason it's 7.2, you can you can communicate that from a, uh, a quantum uh, mechanic point of view. Now, let me just say one more thing here. I'm going to get sometimes maybe speaking over your, some of your heads. Don't worry about it. Um, just watch the stuff like a movie. Take in what you can take in. And, uh, and don't worry that you're not getting something, because you're getting whatever you need. And, uh, and, and so I'm talking to a lot of people on a lot of different levels. And, uh, just get what you can and what you can is okay. Uh, in, in quantum physics, you can look at like this pin as either being made up of little tiny particles or made, or made up of, 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 you could say, sound, wavelength. And, uh, and if you looked at all the, uh, so there's a very specific, what's called a sine wave signature. We saw what a sine wave was. A sine wave signature is, um, say, something that would look like this. It would come up on a computer monitor. Or maybe it would be look like that. Or maybe it would be... There, there's like a handwriting signature. It's a very specific signature. And every physical object in the universe has its own signature. Its own sound wave signature. In fact, it's a language. Uh, some people believe that if, in fact, it is possible, if you absolutely create the signature, you create the object. But if you took all the objects in our universe and you, they're all putting out their own sound, if you want, and if you average or compute the average of all those sounds, you get 7.23 centimeters long, which is a re pretty short wavelength of about so long, like I said, between the distance between the eyes. And from my point of view, that's also ohm that the Hindus and Tibetans refer to Om. Om is the sound of the universe. It's the sound of all things at one moment. Well, in terms of looking at the dimensional levels, uh, there are uh, 140, many people, if you talk to various people, they'll refer to these 144 dimensional levels that are in the octaves. Well, what this is, is again, looking at your music, you have 12 basic notes and then you have your 13th one which is the return or the next octave 
going up to the next offit, repeating the same uh, basic things over again. And, uh, and in between each one of these 12, there are 12 overtones that uh, approximate, approximate exactly, <laughs> the, uh, the larger one, which are holographic in nature. And so sound or electromagnetic light is, is holographic in nature. It can, you can go uh, within it, uh, just like you can go within any particular point in, in, the, in the, into a table. You can go down in any point, down in the microcosm, or you can go above. And it's the same way. This whole octave becomes a note. Like there's, there's larger octaves where the whole octave becomes a note relative to another octave above that one. And because there's 12 of these between each one of these notes, and you've got 12 notes, the 12 times 12 produces the 144 dimensional levels. And uh, so you have these 144 dimensions. And though so you have 12 primary ones, and these are what in Star Trek you might call subspace. They're, they're, they're real worlds. They're just as infinite as anywhere else, they just aren't whole note universes. And, uh, and they're just as important. They all have life. They're all, all this is filled with life. It's totally. I don't know if there are any. There might be some that are not filled with life. But yeah, there are some that are not filled with life, but <coughs> not very many. And, uh, and where we sit right now is right here. on the third dimension of, this, of, of an octave. So it does not mean the x, y, z axis being the three dimensions of space and then the fourth dimension being time, this kind of concept. Forget that. Uh, we just happen to be sitting on the third note of this octave with a wavelength about so long. And if you were to, uh, and our consciousness is tuned to this wavelength, which puts us here. And we are breathing in a very specific way, which tunes us, which is the key, that tunes us to this particular universe. But if you were to change your breathing and to change your tune your consciousness level to a different wavelength, if you were capable of doing that, you would disappear, literally, body and all, right out of the space and reappear into the one that you tune to. And, uh, and that, that whole science has a name, which is called Merkaba. Uh, and Merkaba is uh, uh, one of the bottom lines of what we're going to talk about in this workshop. Uh, it's, it, though it's spoken in one word, one word in present day, it's really three words. Uh, it's mer, which is a, f which is a, which is light, but it's a very specific kind of light. It's a counter-rotating fields of light. And uh, and then there's ka, which in almost all of the ancient languages means spirit. And ba, or sometimes said uh, va, depending on the uh, language it came from. The the, the uh, in Hebrew, it's va. It means uh, body, though that only holds true if there are bodies. <laughs> if you're, as you move up, there's, you rapidly move into areas where uh, matter is not uh, a part of the relationship. And uh, so it could either mean body or it could just simply mean reality, uh, the taking of a, a, a reality or a portion of the reality with you. And so uh, the three words together mean a counter-rotating counter field of light that contains both spirit and body. And it becomes a vehicle to take you from one dimension into another, one universe to another. This is known everywhere by everybody, except for when you come way, way, way down where like we are, <laughs> where we're unconscious and we don't remember very much. But everybody else knows. It's like, you know. Everybody's totally aware of it, though uh, the, the science is known 
to greater and greater degrees as people progress up further. We're as far down the line as you can get. Uh, down in these two other octaves, this is not even self-aware. We're at the very bottom. This is the lowest possible consciousness in the octave there is of consciousness uh, and still be self-aware. Um, there, there's only one level of consciousness underneath us and that one uh, is actually higher than us. I'll have to explain that later. So we're the lowest form of... We're the bottom right now. And so... Uh, so each one of these changes the uh, wavelength, gets actually shorter uh, as you go up in higher energy levels. And uh, uh, kind of like red light has a long wavelength and, and violet or purple has a short wavelength. And, it, and shorter wavelength is higher energy. And uh, as you progress up through the dimensional levels, you go into sh shorter and shorter and shorter wavelengths. You go this way, they get longer. And and of course there's an octave below this and there's an octave above it and um, and the octave above it and below it has very specific relationships to each other and but music is the key once you once you know the wavelength of this one and you know music you can calculate very precisely all the wavelengths of all the other ones depending on your accuracy of how good you got that one and um, and you could know exactly right where they are and between these uh, in between each one of these uh, uh, universes is nothing. <laughs> it's void. It's absolutely no thing. It's, it, uh, and there's different kinds of voidness. There's 144 different kinds of voidness, each one having different meaning depending on what one you're in. But there's, but it's no matter how you do it, it's still it's nothing, no, no thing. Only spirit moves through these various levels. And uh, though they have learned how to uh, uh, take matter through these voids up to here. And right there and over here also, there are what call what many people refer to as the great walls. Uh, there are these there, there are these void states here and here that are so great and so deep and so vast in their nature that uh, no thing can pass through them. This is the dilemma of certain people like the Greys, which we will go into later on. So many of you may not who, know who the Greys are. But uh, the Greys are a particular race of beings in, in, in this octave that have uh, progressed uh, intellectually to the point of saturation, you might say. They have uh, they got it all. They, uh, at least they got half of what they didn't get the emotional side of it but they did get the intellectual side of it and intellectually they can find no way to get through here because the only way you can get through there is just spirit all by itself and they're trying to use physical machines UFOs flying craft to get through and there is no way at least there's no known way in existence and uh, and so this uh, basic understanding will help when we start referring to uh, uh, various things at different dimensional levels. Where we are, what we are, what this class is, teaches is how to go from one particular level to another specific level, which lies. One, two, three. They sit right here, right before the fifth dimension. It's the the tenth, eleventh, and twelfth overtone of the fourth dimension. This is the fourth, and this one's the fifth, on a chromatic scale. And it's right here that we're going to go from here to there. And, uh, and this is uh, just above the angelic realms, of which is the uh, seventh, eighth, and ninth overtone of the fourth dimension. And the tenth, and eleventh, and twelfth is where... Uh, a particular level of unity consciousness begins to take place. It begins in these levels, though it really doesn't um, really impact the the, conscious, the person making the transition until they get to the fifth. But it's it's right here where you would call Christ consciousness. There is a a body that exists everywhere, 
and there is only one of these bodies. There is only one Son of God. And, uh, and this body extends from this point out, and, uh, and there's, an, you might say, an infinite number of beings that are connected to this body, or cells in this body. And, and, uh, and, and it's a very specific understanding, a, a very specific interpretation of the reality. There's only one reality, but there's a lot of ways to interpret it. And, uh, and so this is where uh, this particular Merkaba that I'm teaching will take us to go from planet Earth to these very specific places. And from there, uh, you won't need me or anything else because after that, uh, once you learn how to get there, uh, you'll be met by uh, other specific levels of awareness that are connected to you and take you on through through the rest of it. And so the job of this workshop is just to make this one little step over to here. And whether or not you go into the 10th, 11th, or 12th doesn't really matter, but you will go according to your nature. Uh, there are three different uh, particular levels there. And those are, that's a stepping stone. Of the, it's a, uh, a place to make a translation from there to the fifth. And from then on in, you're going to move very rapidly uh, beyond your imagination right now. There aren't any words I can tell you that would even come close to talk about that. We can talk about this kind of. But from there on out, it, it's just words that don't mean a whole lot about anything except experience. And so this is uh, the essence on a technical level what we're going to be teaching here. And so now, uh, I'm going to go straight into, uh, now that we got that, uh, and, and I'm going to take one second here now. Is there any questions on this? Uh, when we go to the fourth dimension of the 10th, 11th, and 12th, is it Earth in a higher dimension, or is it someplace totally different? Uh, yeah, we will be on Earth still. On another, there are many, uh, the dimensions are all superimposed. They're not, you don't go anywhere to get there. They're all of them, without exception, are right here in my hand. They're all passed through each other. And they're all in the same place. It's a matter of tuning. It's like a television. You got one TV, you, uh, you change the channel, which you, all you're doing is changing the wavelength of the reception. And you get a different picture. And, uh, and so Earth has many dimensional levels, though it's really not that many. It has the third dimensional level. It has, uh, uh, there's kind of a vacuum uh, right after the third. But st uh, in the fourth, there's a lot going on between the fourth and all the way up into, uh, well, we've got it going all the way up until, we've got some going all the way up until the 12th. At this point, we've even got it over into the 13th, which is incredible. There is a, the cream of the crop of our awareness has made it the Ascended Masters, a small number of our Ascended Masters, has figured out how to get onto the other side of the wall. So Earth has made the leap all the way over here, though it's only a very small number of us. And uh, so we have these uh, different places in there. In terms of the octave, uh, we, uh, we have a lot of life going on in the fourth dimension. Uh, there's a lot going on in the fifth. There's a whole lot going on in the sixth, especially in the last three overtones of the sixth dimension. The uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th overtone is where all these ascended masters reside. There's a whole world there that, uh, of universe that's there on, the, on Earth. And then, uh, uh, I think there's only three or four people who are able to get into the seventh dimension, which is in terms of the human body, is the pineal gland. And, uh, and it was their understanding that allowed us to go into, over to the Great Wall. There's a, there's a huge learning process that's going on with the Ascended Masters right now. I mean, they're just learning like crazy right now on, on a lot of things. And so we do have these other universes that are around what the Earth is tuned to. There's got to be somebody there tuned to it. You know, there's got to be a consciousness that's tuned to it. And so there's life there that is tuned to this. Uh, it's very complex, and I, can't, I don't want to get into all of it because it's very complex. I uh, can't speak unless you've got the, <laughs> the magic part. Um, I have a question about, um, do these also, these um, dimensions, do they also relate, 
or correspond to the chakra in the body? Are we moving Absolutely. from out They're of the identical. third? You have 12 primary the chakras, the 13th yeah. one's over your head. Yeah. And uh, the chakra system running up, the template that creates the chakra system is exactly the same template that creates the universes. It's also exactly the same one that creates the light patterns. It's the same one that creates your eyes. It's the same one that all your, uh, your mental patterns are stored on. It's uh, used your emotional body. Uh, it's the same exact template. But it is the same. The, the shock patterns moving up here, and this is absolutely the one. Okay, so we're not going anywhere. We're just opening up and moving into that different shock. Yeah, you're, it's and not really a movement. It's a consciousness change. And then there's, there's possibly, I mean, uh, we've experienced moving into the different... Uh, different chakras at times, but this seems to be um, uh, settling of inside of that fourth well, dimension. Well, there is a real difference in like moving your, your uh, uh, attention from one chakra to another and actually going into it. Because if you actually uh, go beyond just moving attention and you actually go into that chakra, uh, you will be in that Place, you will be in that universe. And so it's it's kind of like the difference between uh, talking about going to, to Europe and actually getting on a plane and flying over there, which is the actual experience. And so uh, a lot of times, much of the meditation, even if you're talking about the, even Vipassana meditation, if you're sitting for 18 hours or something of this kind of nature, uh, uh, that may or may not be the experience. You may still be veiled. You may be sitting there thinking you're having the experience and not. Uh, the actual experience is pretty. I mean, if you ever move, say, into the heart chakra, uh, you will abs you will know definitely that you moved into the heart chakra because you will become the entire universe. Uh, uh, it, it's an experience that's beyond words, and if you have that, uh, you'll, you'll know it. Whereas you can sit for 40 years of meditation thinking you're having the experience of the heart chakra, which really you're not. So, uh, I don't know for sure what to say to you on that. Is it possible with frequency sound to move? We're talking about doing the breathing, which is also uh, frequencies, but there must be a sound wave that okay. can vibrate. You can, um, yeah, there is. You can, uh, the, the, t the technique of the Merkaba that I'm using is based on breathing. Um, there are other techniques around breathing that will do similar things that will work also. This, the one that I'm using is the primary one. It's the easiest one and simplest one, and it's the one that most people in the universe uh, find quicker. Though there are lots of other ones, it's not the only way. There are other breathing techniques. But the criteria is, is that all you have to do is tie the information of the Merkaba to any aspect of your uh, physical body. So uh, you could tie it to sound. You can tie it to the human voice. The human voice has the level of frequencies of everything that's necessary to scan this. Uh, you could also tie it to uh, other aspects of the body. You could tie it to, uh, to the very movement of the body through space, if you wanted to. Uh, you could tie it to, um, uh, to sexual energy and tantra, or to, uh, uh, to heart rhythms. If you, it has to be something you can control. You have control over. If you can control your heart, then you can use that rhythm. Uh, but, if you, but, but the, one of the easiest things to control is breathing. And, it's, and it has direct relationships. So that's why we use breathing. It's the simplest one. Those are, there's a lot of other ones. If you study uh, Shiva in Hinduism through Shiva, you'll see that there are 113 forms of meditation that they teach. Uh, the, and this is very similar to what I'm saying. There are the first eight of those 113 forms are breathing techniques. Now, they say these are all the meditation techniques that are in existence, according to Shiva. The first eight of them are breathing, and they're very different patterns, and no matter what the breathing uh, pattern is around the world, they can fit it into one of those eight. And, uh, and then after that, you've got 
104 more. It's actually 100. There's 112 and one. The first 112 are all male because they have form and they have shape, and you can communicate it from one person to another. You say, this is how you do it. The 113th one is female, and it has no form. So you can't tell someone how to do it. It's just following the heart, and there is no right or wrong way. And so that's different. But the male ways all have, you do it this way, and you breathe this way, and you do this way. You get form to it. And the 104 ways after the first eight are in are totally unique. They're all primal uh, functions. They're different. Uh, uh, I can't remember them all. I can only remember a few, but one of them that, that, that when I read it, it was giving a course that's a primal thing. One of them is that you're just sucking your thumb. <coughs> it's very primal. It's the first thing a baby does, man. And, uh, and, uh, and for some people, they can suck their thumb and remember their connection to God. Only a few, just one, and maybe 200,000 people. I'm just guessing. It's only a few. You can, uh, if you start messing around with this stuff before you're ready, uh, you could go into some dimensional level that you're not ready for. And when you do that, what, what life does, if you show up somewhere where you're not supposed to be, they, uh, life uh, kind of confiscates you. <laughs> says, well, okay, you got here ahead of time. You just wait now, and it'll hold you there. And you won't be able to move. It'll hold you there until the rest of your consciousness, the rest of the cells, um, made up. For those of you who read the Emerald Tablets, who's read the Emerald Tablets? Here? A few people remember when Thoth was entering into the sixth dimension. He wrote that book two thousand years ago, and uh, but at that time he was really afraid because that was when he was just beginning to enter. And of course now they're all living in the sixth dimension. They were just going in there, and when they got in there, there was the hounds that were chasing them and trying to get them. And if they got them, they would hold them and uh, and keep them. They don't kill you. I mean, they just hold you. That's all. They just keep you there for a while. And uh, so you could get uh, detained or arrested <laughs> if you proceed too quickly and too far. But uh, you won't get hurt. I mean, ultimately, you'll. You may have to wait a long time. It would be uh, better to proceed in, in, uh, in an organic, not to be so, in so much of a hurry or, and experience each one of the steps that you have to. Can we only get a couple more questions? I'm going to go on. You mentioned that the grays could travel from one wall to another. Is that they are trapped within these walls. So they can exist in other dimensions or do exist? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're real good. They can go anywhere within these 144 dimensions. They just can't get out. And uh, the Lucifer aspect, how far can he travel? Also from Walt? Lucifer is also trapped in those 144 dimensional levels. Thank you. Okay, two more questions and that's it. Just these two people here. What is the difference between the successive octaves and getting through the wall just puts you to a new octave? Well, octave. you see, once... Okay, that's a good question. Uh, each, remember I've said that we exist on other, I think I said, we exist on other levels when we're talking about the angels being us on their own. You exist on a lot of other levels. Uh, most people exist on anywhere from five to maybe a hundred or so more other dimensional levels. I mean, literally you have a counterpart, an aspect of you that is literally there, and it's you. And uh, though there, that most of that is totally conscious of itself stretched throughout there, it's only this lowest, lowest, lowest level, us down here, that we're not aware, though the as other aspect of it is aware of you. And, uh, and if you were to... Uh, play those notes, if you look at this as like a piano, and you were to play those uh, other worlds that you're on, you would find that they form chords, almost always, it's really rare, unless you're a terrible piano player, <laughs> you almost always will play, will be in harmonic, other dimensional levels that are harmonic with the, with the one that you're in. And, uh, 
and there's a lot of combinations that are that can come out of here besides this one. So there's lots and lots of other combinations. But what happens is a person or a little spirit will learn how to play one chord, and then once it figures out, hey, you can make chords, it'll try another one, and then another one, and another one, and pretty soon it learns how to play the piano. And eventually it learns how to go through all 144 dimensional levels. And the key is to be able to go into that world and be conscious and stable and stay there. Because what usually happens when you go into a dimensional world that you're not supposed to be there, it's either going to trap you there or it's going to spit you back out and throw you back out. You can't stay there for maybe more than just maybe a few minutes and experientially or just a short time and it'll just, you'll, you'll, you're really throwing yourself out, which I'll explain later. But uh, it won't keep you, uh, you won't be able to stay there. But after a while, when you slowly start learning how to play the piano, you slowly learn how to go into any of these worlds and be comfortable and stay there, no matter where it is, no matter how high it is or low it is or complex or simple or whatever is going on. Uh, the, uh, and each one of these different universes are visually, experientially, and sensually totally different, absolutely, completely different. Just going from where you're going to go right now to this next one up here, it's so different that it's going to take me a long time to describe it. The colors, there's not even, even the colors aren't the same. Shape is not, will not be anything like your mind can conceive of right now. Everything will be real, real different though there's, but between this close of a jump there are certain similarities. And, uh, but as you go up it really starts changing a lot. And so uh, it takes time and for a spirit to eventually get to the place where it can go through all of them. When someone does that, when they finally learn how to do them all, and then they learn how to get onto the other side, and they realize, son of a gun, it keeps repeating itself, and they realize, wow, it's all the same. It just repeats itself. Then a big lesson happens right here for that spirit, and uh, they, uh, a choice has to be made. Uh, at that point, they can, they can see the whole. And they, uh, no matter what octave they're in, they can see the whole from that point. And they either uh, decide long before they ever reach this place, they're going to realize that, that uh, there is no inside and outside, and that everything that is, is them. And, uh, and so there'll be a, a, that kind of connection. But when they make this jump, they will really understand that, and because uh, they, they will have spanned uh, the, the whole spectrum of, of this experiment that we're in. And at which point they either are going to, uh, because they know that all life is them, they're either going to make the decision to stay here in this waveform universe and, uh, and to help uh, all the aspects that are lower to, to get through and to understand, or in other words, to complete the experiment. They're either going to do that or they're going to go leave, go what the Tibetans call beyond the beyond the beyond the beyond. They're going to leave the whole universe totally, step back outside the system from which it was created, and uh, return into godness, uh, return into the single spirit that created this from be, before, be, before, and from which uh, either way is okay. Uh, uh, it just depends on what you you choose. Uh, if you choose to do that, if you choose to stay here, uh, the name for that is Melchizedek. And it's another level of consciousness that is very much like Christ consciousness. I mean, it, it is one that is that is uh, span the whole spectrum. And, um, and, and if you do that, the moment you make that decision in your heart, uh, life grabs you. <laughs> real good, and uh, it uses you, and, uh, and it uses you primarily in dimensional changes and, and things to do with dimensions because you're an expert at it. And so whenever there's a problem in any of the worlds or levels, octaves, where there's, there's always little problems, just like there is in your body. Um, when problems happen, then life will use the Melchizedek to go in and to try to alter or change or do whatever life wants, wants it to do. Uh, if you go beyond, 
you brought with you experience back to uh, to that which created the experiment. And so either way, it's okay. Uh, but uh, there is a point where you make a decision. If you do choose to be, to stay within the Malachistic consciousness, you then uh, really can't help yourself anymore because you've gone as far as you can on that level. There's nothing, there's nothing to do but to go back down into life and to, uh, and to serve and to work and to try to help because you know absolutely beyond any doubt whatsoever that life is, that there's an absolute unity to life. And so you, you begin to allow God to work through you in such, so that the, the original intent of the, of the uh, creation unfolds. <coughs> Many of you in this room are very close to making that decision. On certain levels, there's certain completion patterns that you have to do. Well, that's not true for most people on Earth. Most people on Earth are still, some of them are still working with first simple chords. That doesn't mean that they're, that you're higher than them. It just means, because you are them. It just simply means that you are, that your point of consciousness is, a little bit further down, and so you have more responsibility. That's all, because you just got more to do. Work harder. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talked of the, um, the few masters who are right at the... Um, I can't see who's... Oh, oh you're over there. there. Same place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the few masters who are right at the wall, and they're learning a whole bunch right now, are they just within this octave, or... Yeah, they're just within, the, this is earth consciousness I'm referring to. And earth consciousness is learning how, at the moment, to go through the wall and to make these kinds of decisions. And it's looking like uh, we're all going to be faced with these decisions because if, if we, what we think is true, we are about to make an extremely unheard of, unparalleled, never seen before, rapid change from where we are down here all the way through all these dimensional levels at an extremely accelerated pace. We don't know why it's happening. Uh, we just think, we believe at this point that that's what's going to happen. Right? And, uh, and, all, and everything's already opening up that way. Um, if it happens, it's going to be extraordinary. It's going to be an extraordinary experience. You might hard wait. Because <laughs> this is brand new. You know, there's not very many brand new experiences uh, in the universe, but this is a brand new experience. So only every once in a while that God intersects outside the system and that appears to be what's happening right now on earth is that God is directly intervening from outside the system it's, uh, it's great I like that to say. Yeah. okay we'll take that one last question then you just speak it out loud oh. what is the reason that God is intervening now and, uh, he, he, he put this little seed into the universe uh, and created a situation where there was there was no other way to go, and then when that seed was chosen, then everything is unfolded because of it. So it, it, hidden deep in the universe was this little thing, which we'll talk about later, and uh, and it's created everything that's happening here. The way it's gone, it's, it's it's like it's pretty obvious that this is what uh, us on the outside of the system wanted to take place, but. Uh, but why now? Uh, I can say why now on certain levels, but why now on the big picture, I have no idea. Okay, one more. You're actually <laughs> looking for <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Okay, give me the magic wand. Okay. Well, I'm trying to think of what I want to say. And then right after this, uh, we'll cut this one, and this will be the f first one. So why are we here, and what, what has that seed been implanted in us? Because before I arrived, I kept hearing that word without ever hearing it before. What word? Merkaba. Oh, Merkaba. Well, it's an ancient word, and we all know the sound of it. The Zulus in, in Africa, when they're talking, they talk about how they came in. This, this guy is going around all over the world right now talking about their ancient culture. And he talks about how they come in uh, on these disc-shaped Merkabas, mm -hmm. using exactly the same word. It's in their ancient tradition. 
or if you go back to Ezekiel in the Bible, or if you go to uh, uh, I mean, it's the sound of that word is ancient, and it's it's uh, it's an old 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 one. But uh, why you? When you're talking about you coming here, nobody can answer that question but you. That's why uh, us. you have you, I mean, each person. A group of us. Well, there are people that are coming from. Uh, there's people that are coming from the past. There's people that's coming from within the future. There's people that's coming from into the future. Uh, a lot of intersecting stuff that's going on here that's usually not done in the kinds, at least to the degree that it's being taken place here right now. There's a lot of things going on. We'll slowly unfold this over over uh, the next few days to, to the best of my ability to explain all the different levels that are going on. But. Uh, there's a lot of people coming here that are very advanced souls uh, that uh, has re and you have real definite purpose why you're here. Though most of you, or many of you, don't know what that is right now. Or you may feel it in your heart. You may not know, you know exactly what it is. Uh, and that's part of my job is to try to jar those memories.